Good afternoon for those uh, in uh, uh, actually in the uh, Salt Lake City or to the east of us. And I know that for uh, Robert Romanishin, who is already sitting ready, it is uh, still morning. And for whoever or wherever you are in the world, we want to welcome you to this In Conversation with Robert Romanishin. And this is a very uh, special uh, uh, conversation we will have. And let me uh, first introduce to you uh, Robert Romanishan. He is an uh, emeritus professor of psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute. He has published essays in psychology, philosophy, literature, and educational journals, journals written a play about Frankenstein's monster, has done radio and TV discussions, as well as online interviews, webinars like these, uh, made a movie about a... a trip of his to the Antarctica. He gives uh, keynote lectures all around the world. He has been a, a psychotherapist uh, for many years and his interest of uh, his areas of interest are the psychology of technology, especially in terms of climate issue and social media, grief and the healing power of poetry, the art and practice of psychotherapy, the wisdom and value of dreams, the art of memoir writing and the relations between psychology and the humanities. He's also the author of eight books, including his forthcoming Victor Frankenstein, The Monster and the Shadows of Technology, The Frankenstein Prophecy, which will be the topic of discussion for us today because the book will be released in May. You can already pre order it. We encourage you it. I had a great fortune to have a sneak preview of the book. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a delightful read, it is poetic, uh, it's rich, it's meaningful. But you will uh, learn more about it because uh, Robert and I will uh, go in conversation about this. So welcome, Robert. Thank you, Machiel. That was a really fine introduction. I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, I was a kid who grew up in Brooklyn. How did I do all of that? So I don't know. It's been fun and important for me, yeah. Yeah, so please tell us a little bit about uh, your upbringing. You grew up in Brooklyn and, and, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, so what I just said is not a facetious or offhand remark. Um, I grew up in a house with no books. My parents were really hardworking, middle-class people. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a time when when hard work really mattered. And uh, I, I had a sense of really learning to love books because there was a library in our neighborhood. Um, and my sister, who was six years older than me, one day, it was, you know, it's a neighborhood where I played stickball and hung around with friends. And one day she said to me, I want to show you something. And I walked into the library and it changed my life. Mm. So um, my father and my mother encouraged my education. And uh, once I got into uh, school, I began to really just love learning. It was like it opened up books, um, music, opened up doorways that I before that never knew existed. And that started me on uh, the path through high school and, and uh, college, graduate school, so. And, and when did your uh, interest for psychology really got triggered? Well, um, I had the good fortune to go to uh, a very good high school where I had a very strong uh, education in languages, Latin and uh, literature. And from there, I went to Manhattan College. And in my junior year of college, um, I was in pre-med. I had dropped out of philosophy, switched to pre-med, and I had this sense that I wanted to be a psychiatrist. Huh. So at the end of my third year, uh, I had a dream. And so what led me into psychology is this dream. 
And in oh. this dream, I'm walking down a long hallway. And at the end of the hallway is a panel of frosted glass like you used to see in these old doctor and dentist office. Um, and there's a light shining from inside. And so as I get closer and closer and closer to the doorway, I finally see my name on the door. And it says, Robert Romanishan MD. And then it had underneath it my specialty. And it was proctology. <laughs> proctology. <laughs> now, I knew nothing about dreams then, but something in me said, my God, this I better pay attention here because... I'm in pre-med and I don't want to study to be a proctologist. I wanted to go to the other end, to psychiatry, the mind. And here I am stuck in, if you pardon the pun, the shit. Yeah. I knew nothing about alchemy. The gold is in the shit. But I changed my major and I went into psychology. And I thought I would find in psychology a way hmm. of finding what I I haven't been able to find up until that point, and that is a sense of where do I fit in the world? You know, I, I, I felt like an outsider in some ways, and I thought, well, mm -hmm. psychology would be a homecoming for me. And so I changed my major, and then I went to Duquesne University. Uh, at that time, it had started the first and only program in existential phenomenological psychology. Uh, and it was marvelous. I spent five years there in the graduate program, studying with some of the best-known European phenomenological philosophers, psychologists, existentialists, and good faculty at Duquesne. So mm -hmm. that, in short, is, is why I'm here today. Yeah, and uh, I you already hear you touch on topics as uh, homecoming. Mm. which uh, I've uh, seen in your book as well. But uh, before we go there, uh, maybe uh, when, what age did you uh, become a therapist? What, uh, mm. how, how did you end up uh, there? Um, well, I, I entered the program at Duquesne, and that was, uh, they had three tracks then, clinical, social, maybe only two, I don't remember that. I did my dissertation on the, in, uh, as a social, uh, under the direction of a social psychologist, Ralph von Eckertsburg, who had studied with uh, Timothy Leary at Harvard. Those were wild days studying with him. He was a good man. Uh, oh, an experimental. They had an experimental tra track. But I wanted to be a clinician. So I started my training in 64, got my master's in 66, uh, started to do. Uh, clinical work in state hospitals, really good training in those days because a lot of the patients weren't medicated into zombie-like situations. So I worked with people who were in the midst of schizophrenic episodes. And, yeah. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, and then when I got my doctorate in 70, uh, I had my own private practice for a while uh, until I moved to Texas where I continued my private practice. And uh, all that time when I was at Duquesne, and then after that, uh, I was in uh, first psychotherapy, and then for many, many years in first both Freudian and then Jungian analysis. Um, and I continue to this day now and then to, to uh, get a couple of sessions from my current analyst. You know, when I'm in a crossroads or something, or I have a dream that I really can't do anything with. So yeah. it's been indispensable for me, both to be with patients and for myself at different points, to be on that side, to be a patient, and yeah. to be patient about where I am. And then um, you, you have been a teacher at Pacifica for many, many years. When, uh, when did you uh, start there? And well, I, uh, I was working at uh, the University of Dallas. Uh, I went there in 72, um, left Pittsburgh, my wife, two children. And uh, we had started a graduate program at the University of Dallas that uh, was devoted to existential phenomenological approaches to psychology. 
Robert Sardello and I founded that program. He got interested in the work of James Hillman, mm-hmm. invited James Hillman uh, to come and, and Pat Berry, and they became uh, members of the psych department at the University of Dallas. So there was this really rich dialogue that went on with Sardello, Pat Hillman, and, and James, uh, Pat Berry and James Hillman on one side, and me on the other, holding the flag for phenomenology. Yeah. I really learned a lot in that dialogue because James was a really good fighter, you know? Yeah. And that's where the work that I do was really uh, nourished because I, I bring together the traditions was trained also in natural science psychology. So I bring in that tradition and the tradition of uh, phenomenological existential, humanistic, and Freudian, Jungian, and depth psychology. And that has been a creative uh, soil for me to do my work. Yeah. So I went then uh, to, uh, I was in Dallas, and then the program began to fall apart. And Uh I desperately wanted to get out of Dallas. And uh, one day I get a phone call from Charles Asher, who was here at Pacifica. And one thing led to another, and I wound up here in 1992. Yeah. Just retired three years ago. What a a marvelous journey. Mm. And uh, in a... And I've uh, read some of your other books as well. And it uh, looks like this new book that is coming out is somewhat of a culmination of, uh, of, of, of a lot of uh, topics and themes you've been thinking about throughout your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I think, you know, as I look back, there's, some, there's something about well, you, you know, maybe at, at my age, 76, you look back and you begin to see that your life has had a pattern, but of which you have not been the maker. And so you begin to see that you've really just followed the threads that have been, uh, or the breadcrumbs that have been yeah. left for you. Yeah. And I think the themes that have always been there was the sense of, um, what is the sense of home? But, but that, that was tied to the question of nature because I always, even as a young child, I loved, I, I loved just being in the world outside. Maybe that's why I was led into phenomenology. Oh. I remember when I was very young, I used to love summer vacations. I'd get up early in the morning before the, I wanted to see the world begin. And I was fascinated by these ants that would crawl in the brown dirt down in a hole. And I got into this fantasy of what it would be like to sink into that earth. So that was one thing, homecoming. And I felt when I started to do my graduate work, especially in the 80s, and I realized that the power of technology to destroy the world and nature was fast increasing. And we had broken our bonds with nature. And so I wanted to investigate how technology, its origins and development, have led us so far away from a sensuous bond with nature. And that has really been the two themes that have been predominant, then how to apply that in different ways. Yeah. And so in this, uh, this new book of uh, yours, you uh, talk about Victor Frankenstein and the monster. And uh, maybe uh, you could uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the story itself of Frankenstein uh, before we go into your book so that we get a bit of context. Yeah. Um, well, I think I first really became... Uh, enticed by the Frankenstein story when I was writing my book on technology in the 80s. Hmm. Um, And I remember teaching at the University of Dallas and there was a theater there and I had my graduate students, or maybe it was undergraduate, I forget, but we went into the theater and just did a little kind of enactment of Mary Shelley's story. Yeah. And it, it kind of receded into the background. And 
the technology book came out and much to my surprise, because it's not an easy book to read, it's, a, it's really for an educated academic audience, but it's yeah. had five. So if I can comment on that, that, is, that book is far more dense. This one is very uh, uh, approachable for everyone. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to do, because I think in the 30 years since I first published the technology book, the pace, the scope, and the dangers, or the crisis, a better word of technology, mm. have increased. So it was the same impetus. In 89, I wanted to figure out how we wired the world for potential destruction yeah. of the earth of all life. And now it has gotten even worse, the situation. So I wanted to, to do the same thing, but in a much more accessible way. Yeah. And then Frankenstein came back to me. And I would guess for the last 10 years, I've been reading, rereading that story. And for the last seven years, I've been working on different variations of the Frankenstein book. Um, and so the themes that were in the technology book now are personified and turned into a story Mm. Sonified to Victor Frankenstein, the monster, and the other characters, and the story of what Mary Shelley's work is about. Could you give us a brief synopsis of that Mary, Mary Shelley story? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, I think um, one of the <laughs> important things to begin with is the title of the story is Frankenstein Semicolon or the modern Prometheus. So she's telling us there, I mean, if you think about language, you know, and a lot of people don't, but there's a lot of richness in the semicolon. You know, it's, it's saying, not a full stop, but it's saying there's some connection between Victor Frankenstein and the myth of Prometheus. Mm -hmm. So the title alerts us to pay attention to that, not quite an identification, but uh, a connection between. So Victor Frankenstein's story is a way of retelling the myth of Prometheus. Now, yeah. what makes it different is that Mary Shelley is telling this myth of Prometheus now from the point of view of modern science and technology. Mm -hmm. Remember, she's, she's writing this in 1815 when interest in galvanism the powers of electricity to make dead tissue. Yeah. Um, Percy Shelley, her husband, did such experiments, and, and the group that she was with was interested in that. So what, what she's doing there is retelling that myth, and then in the book I go into um, how, because she tells it from the point of view of science and technology, Victor Frankenstein is radically different from... Prometheus. So I started to get interested in the story and then the next thing that's important is she tells us in the beginning that the story came about when one night when she and Percy and Lord Byron and his physician um, was sitting around a fire, the weather was bad and they were telling ghost stories which was what people did in those days you know fascination with ghosts and vampires and all of that. And somebody, we don't know who suggested, well, why don't each of us write a story? Now, we don't know if Byron or Shelley ever attempted. We know that his physician wrote an early story about vampires, mm -hmm. um, which itself is interesting. Uh, but Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, 18-year-old woman. And she begins the story by saying it began with a waking dream. You know that twilight state between being fully asleep and being in the dream and being awake and outside the dream and maybe interpreting it already? And she describes the scene huh. where she sees this creature, the monster, and the whole story that she lays out is in that dream. So it begins in a dream, and the dream plays an important role throughout the text. So that's the second important point. Mm -hmm. Victor Frankenstein, just to give another little brief summary, uh, 
the first impression that Mary Shelley says uh, made a mark on his soul was then was when a tree outside his house in his garden was blasted by lightning. And so Mary Shelley says for young Victor Frankenstein, he went to his father curious about the powers of nature, electricity, lightning to destroy. Mm. The next link is when his mother dies. He's 15 years old and he's terribly grief stricken, but he refuses to give time to grieve and he connects it with the destruction of the tree. Yeah. He says, if the forces, I'm paraphrasing, if the forces mm -hmm. of nature can destroy, I can use them to create. And that's the way he deals with his mother's death. He is going to remove, he says, the stain of death, the great spoiler he calls death from human life so that no one will ever have to die except maybe through accident, but then he could resurrect them. So the second important thing is that refusing to grieve turns Victor Frankenstein toward his own dream to become a new creator God that would be able to erase the stain of death from human life. Along the way, the denial of death, we might say, comes back with a vengeance in the story. Um, first, his brother William. Well, first, let me back up. He creates the monster, but he feels he failed. And when he first sees the monster awake, he's horrified because he had this idea that he would make the monster beautiful. Mm. Turns away in disgust from what he's done runs away, exhausted, falls into sleep, has another dream. I won't say that now unless you want me to, because there's two other dreams in the book that are important. And then the monster comes, wakes him up, and the description that he gives through Mary Shelley of what he sees is he has created something that he calls a devil and a demon doesn't even give him a name. Yeah. So then the monster, he banishes the monster. The monster goes away, but the death he would deny comes back. And the book is filled with death. Death that would be repressed comes back with a vengeance. His brother, his father dies from all the other deaths. His good friend dies uh, at the hands of the monster, mm. the so-called monster. Mm -hmm. And finally, his bride-to-be, Elizabeth Lavenza. So there's a sacrifice in the feminine because he keeps, he creates out of the masculine mind and the feminine is disregarded. And that shows itself in a way he, he really doesn't attend to his bride-to-be. His work becomes more important than the relationship. Yeah. In the end, um, he goes to seek the monster, uh, and he follows him to the Arctic Circle because he wants to kill him. Um, the monster eludes him, and Victor Frankenstein is rescued by a Captain Walton to whom Victor Frankenstein tells the story. Um, and in the final scenes, the monster goes on to the ship seeking redemption, a connection that has always been refused. And the story ends with the monster going off into the dark Arctic night, promising to burn himself to ashes. Huh. So, in summary, that's, that's the major points of the tale. Maybe I would say that uh, Joyce Carol Oates has called it a parable for our time, a cautionary tale about the dangers of acting as if we are gods. Not really... That, that's really what inspired me to write, to write this story in, in this user-friendly way. Yeah. From my point of view, from the point of view of the monster. And what, what is your book then, uh, in what way does your book deal with, with this story? Well, because her book is a parable for our time, and it has endured for over 200 years, uh, 2018, last year was the 200th anniversary of its publication. So what is it about her story that has made it, I think somewhere I read it's 
it's read even more than the Bible now, or second to the Bible. Mm. And it was it grabbed me, and I started to investigate into that. And it's because it fits what Jung calls a visionary work. Yeah. And what that means is that Mary Shelley, writing in the spirit of her times about the fascination with science, was also intuiting the spirit of the depths. And that's what makes Jung's what Jung means by visionary work. It's where the spirit of the depths, its archetypal level, levels and mythic content is there in the story. So it, it has that, that kind of uh, archetypal presence to it. And what, what, what makes the story then so appealing is, not appealing, that's the wrong word. What makes it grab you is that it becomes a parable for our time. Mm. Commentary mm -hmm. on how Mary Shelley's story, particularly when told from the point of view of Victor's creature, whom he never names, but calls monster, devil, and demon, how that lingers today as prophecy. And that's what I tried to capture in my book. I tried to tell the story from the monster's point of view. So I spent about three years reading her text looking for those places that are in the margins, where we get a glimpse of what the monster is trying to say to us. So I try to go into the spirit of the depths that are still lingering in that work. And it, uh, I have to say it was really difficult because it's reading against the conventional wisdom of the story. So it took me about five years to dig that out. And I tell the story uh, in terms of eight questions. Yeah. We can talk about the format later, but questions that are like prophecies that linger in Mary Shelley's work and that speak to us today if we can listen to it. It's the shadow history of that story. Yeah. We, and, 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 and in those questions, you make uh, that, uh, that story really irrelevant to uh, the problems that we deal with these days. Yeah, yeah. That's... That's what I, I, I wanted to do. I wanted, I began to see, so my intention really fit with what the story was offering to me, um, how Mary Shelley's story speaks to our age as a warning. Yeah. And, um, it is so relevant for our times, but you have to read it from the monster's point of view. And so I'm reading it on the margins and took me a while to see that there are eight themes that I could bring out from that story that apply today. And hence I called it the Frankenstein prophecy. And the subtitle is important because it, there's a difference between prophecy and fate. Fate is what yeah. we live out unconsciously. Prophecy, if you begin to see that, that her story has a prophetic character, it means then that we can begin to question and be questioned by the book and use that as a way of looking at where we are today. And that's the beginning of change. Yeah. Possible change. And you deal with, uh, with questions as uh, the influence of technology, the denial of death, uh, homecoming, loneliness, and, uh, and, and a couple of others. Yeah. Yeah. There are eight questions. Uh, in the text. If originally, there were only six. Um, but um, my, my wife, Veronica, and a couple of other people said, well, isn't there any hope? I, I mean, it was uh -huh. pretty, pretty dismal <laughs> in the first go around. Um, but she was right. And so I began to look at it. What are the seeds of hope that are in that? particularly as prophecy, because prophecy awakens us to something that we can take an attitude toward. So there are eight questions. Uh, and there is, if we can become aware of what the story is saying to us, make it more conscious, then maybe we have a chance that that prophecy doesn't become our fate. And yeah. that's what we know today. So... The book is an attempt to speak to what I've always been interested in, the crisis of technology.
Yeah, and and I've uh, while I was reading it, I uh, saw so many uh, uh, possible avenues for us to have a conversation about. <coughs> yeah. uh, each of them are are are, are major life topics. Uh, I read about uh, loneliness, and then I uh, looked it up online, and I saw three out of four Americans suffer from loneliness. Mm. There's a massive amount. And uh, this is something uh, you address in the book, and you talk about uh, friendship. And mm. um, But before we, uh, we maybe go in some of those, uh, those uh, specific uh, uh, questions, we could ask the audience, uh, the participants, if there's anyone that uh, would like to uh, comment via the chat or the, uh, the raise your electronic hand and then we'll weave you into the conversation and you can ask a, a question directly. And if not, we have uh, so many questions here that uh, uh, it's not necessary, but feel free. Or just if something pops up, you can type it into the Q&A or chat. Um, but uh, in the, it, just as uh, is there any of the questions that you pose in the book uh, that is uh, for you uh, relevant today? Well, I I think you know all eight questions uh, are based in the situation we face today. So, for example, what I try to do with each question is the opening of each question opens the uh, opens it with a section from the Frankenstein book. And then I see contemporary examples of that. So uh, do you think it would help if I just read you the eight questions and then talked about a little bit of maybe one of them or uh, yeah. you know, the topics? Yeah let's, yeah, let's just listen to the eight questions. It's also yeah. interesting for, for us as participants. Okay, so um, the book is in the format of questions. And... Uh, so I have to look at my book. I don't have much of it. Sure, sure. Question one is, um, the question, the way it appears in the book, it's in bold type, and that's the theme. And then the prophetic aspect, the Frankenstein prophecies is the subtitle of my book, is the way I take up that question. So question one. This is a theme in Frankenstein's story that is pivotal, resurrecting the dead. That's what the story is about. He's going oh. to bring death to, well, he's going to bring life to death. And the subtitle is in italics. And so the question then is, is Mary Shelley's story a prophecy of the dangers of acting as gods? Mm -hmm. Because that's what Victor Frankenstein does. He, he, he says, in fact, he will be a new creator god and the creatures that he makes will bless him their life. So we see already the beginning of the dethronement of the sacred, of anything higher than ourselves, and the beginning of acting as if our technological powers make us godlike. What are the dangers of that? Question two, the melting polar ice, colon, is Mary Shelley's story a prophecy of the dying of nature? Mm -hmm. That's all around us today. You know, we yeah. see how the powers of science and technology in their shadow side, have contributed much to the crisis we face today in, with nature, the dying of nature. Question three, the monster's body. Is Mary Shelley's story a prophecy of the monster's descendants? Key question. It's a story about Victor Frankenstein creating a monster, but where does he live on today? Because if you take the story psychologically, it doesn't just end in the covers of the book. What are the monsters that we are creating today? We have to go to the margins of our culture to see where they exist. And I do mm. that in the book. Mm. Victor Frankenstein's monster is always marginalized. That's the basic rule of a depth psychological orientation. What we deny responsibility for haunts us from the margins. Question four, out of Africa to the moon, is Mary Shelley's story a prophecy of creating a new species of humankind? And that's where I put together my earlier stuff on technology. Yeah. It's basis in Mary Shelley's book because the monster is a beginning of a new species of humankind. And he has two families. So I trace out in the book how the monster has given rise to a whole line of descendants 
uh, from robots to cyborgs to mm -hmm. ultimately Kurzweil's book of living in the uh, cloud. Um, and the other side is how his kin, the homeless, I uh, trace out a lot of his kin who live now in the margins with him. So a prophecy of a new species of humankind, and I go through several of those. Yeah. Question five, from astronauts to angels in clouds, is Mary Shelley's story a prophecy of the last generation of humankind? There I take up the question how the powers of technology are really increasingly bringing us closer to a kind of um, destruction of nature and therefore ourselves in many ways. And that was the theme of his technology book. Question six, WWW, Adrift in the Digital World. Is Mary Shelley's story a prophecy of being homeless in a wired web world? Yeah. You know? um, this is our new home for us, what we're doing here. And it has value, so I'm not anti-technological. But at the same time, we have to realize the difference between what we're doing now and if I were to meet you like I have in Salt Lake City and we give a hug to each other and we share a meal um, so it's not anti-technological, but are we creating a technology that leaves us homeless in a wired world? So uh -huh. I don't know that. Where our address now is www. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's not anti-technology, my wow. brother. It's raising the question, let's think about the shadow sides of technology. Yeah. Which is yeah. always interesting to me. Question seven, a fundamental question in the book. It's where the book turns. Who is the monster? Is Mary Shelley's story a prophecy of a radical new ethics? Think of all the ways we create monsters. Her book is a primer on marginalization. Think of all the ways in which we exclude others and demonize them. Mary Shelley's book is a kind of warning about that because what we reject in ourselves, project out there and demonize, they come back to haunt us. Think of all the ways that is happening now. It's in fact getting quite scary. And then question eight, are there other seeds of hope? Are there seeds of hope in Mary Shelley's story? Because at one point, uh, you know, Veronica said, you know, Robert, I don't doubt that the book is really, because mm -hmm. um, she lived with me with the book. Yeah. I even became a monster. I hurt my leg and I'm limping along and I damaged my eye. <laughs> you become what you're writing about so that you must in order to really write it. Um, so she said, what are the seeds of hope? And there are seeds of hope in that story. Yeah. There are three or four of them in that. So uh, that's what the book is, is about. And uh, you could take up any one of those and begin to talk about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I know you can. It's fascinating. I, when, I, when I listen to it, I, I wonder, does, does this whole story start with uh, Victor's, Frankenstein's inability to deal with heartbreak? I, I didn't get the last bit, I'm sorry. Uh, is it his inability to, uh, to deal with heartbreak? Yes, that's a good question. Um, that's a that's a fundamental question, and that's why I pose the book as questions because there's a series of questions within the question. Um, Victor Frankenstein is decimated when, as a young boy, his mother dies, and he doesn't know what to do with that death. Yeah. Um, and he gives himself over to finding what, what is the cause of death and how might I begin to overcome it? So he transforms his heartbreak before he gives himself sufficient time to grieve into a quest using the powers of the science and technology of his day to find a cure for death. That yeah. in itself, I mean, when you think about the phrase, a cure for death, that already totally transforms who we are as human beings. And the six, uh, the first six questions in the book 
trace out how we have continued that tale, which has to then include, if we're going to really get away from death, we have to get rid of this, this, this too much flesh. Because then, it is flesh that anchors us to, to the earth and to our mortality. And it also uh, suggests a worldview that doesn't take into account what Jung would call the collective unconscious. That uh, Jung suggested that is the land of the dead. Yeah, no. I mean, from the point of view of Victor Frankenstein as a prototype of modern science and technology, when you're dead, you're dead. Yeah. Well, yeah. He finds the parts for his to create his monster in cemeteries where he digs up the bodies. Well, he's growing up in a Catholic world, Christian world, where the dead are still sacred and the rituals of remembrance are still sacred. But when he enters those cemeteries, he doesn't see that. He sees just material for his work. So, you know, this book, the Frankenstein book, is indebted to the earlier book on technology. And that book on technology made the point that we have moved from the notion of the dead body to the notion of the inanimate corpse. And that's what happens in Victor Frankenstein's book. Mm -hmm. So an earlier book, but made it now in this, this more readable way, I guess, more readable. Um, because I, I, I wanted to appeal to a larger audience but the the uh, the corpses that he digs up and stitches together, he makes his monster of many body parts, and so we become for him simply uh, an assembly of body parts, the anatomical body, and not the living body. And in that, he denies death as a necessity for human life. Um, and of course, the thing he denies comes back as his monster because he never names him and nobody or very few people have told the story from the monster's point of view and that's what I tried to do he's abandoned by his creator and so in some sense Mary Shelley is retelling the story of the Christian story of how we feel adrift and alone in this world and so there's a sense about a loss of the sacred as well to yeah. the Frankenstein's work yeah, in a, in, a, in a very big, big sense. Yeah. Is it in a, in death is sacred and the relationship to death. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in, in the book, I raised the simple question, who do we bury when we bury? Do we bury a corpse or a dead person? So the story is rich. When you read Mary Shelley's story from the point of view of what has been left out on the margins, not from Victor's point of view, but from the monster's point of view, who still has no name, but today lives by many names. Think of all the ways we marginalize people who live on the outside. And what I try to do is to tell the story from that point of view, from the margins. Yeah, like, uh, like a real depth psychology does. Yes, yeah, that's, isn't that what we're called to do? <laughs> that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what we do in therapy. That's what we do when we go into therapy. You know, if you try to live by building the wall between yourself and what you deny, it only gets higher and higher. And look at how many ways today we are demonizing so many other people and putting them behind the wall. Yeah. I'm not going to mention names, but we know what we're talking about. <laughs> Let's see if uh, I see a, a couple of comments and questions were coming in. So let me see. Um, it seems to me th uh, that there is a deep connection to the belief that vulnerability is primarily a weakness negative. How do you feel proposed we reclaim vulnerability as a positive strength? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Yes. I mean, um, not only does Victor Frankenstein want to create a being that will never know death and bless him as a new creator God, but at the same time, um, 
any kind of uh, sense of giving in. What was the word the questioner used? Vulnerability? Yes. Yes. Any kind of vulnerability shows itself as a weakness to be overcome by the power of will. And that's already in the story with Victor Frankenstein. He, he will not allow himself to grieve. So how do we then bring back the positive sense of being vulnerable? Uh, because if we don't, then we become a kind of type of Victor Frankenstein, a type in this sense, not a repetition, mm -hmm. but we conquer anything through the force of our will. That's the connection with Prometheus, but we've forgotten the story. In the myth, Prometheus suffers for going against the gods, you know? We think we won't suffer. And so not allowing ourselves to be vulnerable to uh, death, sorrow, we don't have a way then of really coming to terms with something that is deeper than our own ego conscious will to power. And therefore we make ourselves immune to sorrow. We make ourselves immune to the suffering of others. Yeah. Um, and we see that all around today. Look at the way we marginalize so many people. Uh, so we lose, we lose an aesthetic sensibility. You know, what is it that makes us feel that the homeless person we see on the street is us, you know? If we have already become numbed because we don't have an aesthetic sensibility that has been deadened by not being able to deal with our vulnerabilities, then we become indifferent and even worse, we marginalize everything that we see that doesn't lend itself to our will to power. That's a real danger. So that question is really important. So the, so, so the vulnerability becomes a, is a strength if you can can live from it and truly experience life and pain and participate in grief. Particularly, Machiel, uh, grief in my own life and grief not being able to be faced by Victor Frankenstein in his mother's death. It's a primer on how what happens when we deny grief. But in my own life, grief has been a great teacher for me because in grieving, we give ourselves over to something more powerful and larger than ourselves. We are humbled by our grieving because we are no longer in charge of making the world fit according to our designs. Yeah. Um, that becomes a really important point to be able to to deal with the sorrows of the world, but for that you need an aesthetic sensibility, because and and, and, and what you say an acceptance that life is different than uh, the designs that we have of it or the the wish that we have of it. Yes. Yeah. And 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 accepting that is. Uh, it's really difficult back times, especially if you lose a loved one. Mm. Yeah, don't, well, we have to remember that Mary Shelley's story, subtitled her, is all the modern Prometheus. But yet, Victor Frankenstein and the monster retell that story, and they forget, well, don't forget, but Mary Shelley is teaching us something, that Prometheus, for, for transcending something larger than himself, he wasn't a god but he was in service to the gods and mm. he went against them. So in a certain sense, I think what the story is a primer about is the denial of death leads us to a very difficult place where we refuse to be humbled by any sense of loss. And then if we don't know how to grieve, we are never humbled by anything beyond our own ego conscious wishes and a will to power. And that's the danger that we face today. Yeah. Yeah, we live in a culture that doesn't know how to grieve well, that is not in a, in a good relationship to death. Let me uh, read to you another question that uh, came in. Robert, really enjoying the insights you are sharing. Did you consciously engage with your dreams as a tool to guide you on your journey with writing the book? 
Was there any particular dream that stood out for you or gave you an aha moment to help you discover the eight questions and or solutions you suggest? Those are good questions. Uh, my simplest answer to that question, I didn't really write the book. I paid attention to my dreams, to synchronicities, oh. to injuries that I had, to everything that came in from the margins. Because if I was writing from the monster's point of view, I had to linger on the margins. I couldn't become identified with the monster, but I had to be close enough. And so dreams were very, very important in the, in the doing of this book. Um, in fact, when I thought I was finished with the book, so it would have been the first six questions. Yeah. Veronica says, no, she said, you need some seeds of hope. And I said, yeah. why? I want to awaken people. I don't want to make them feel good. She said, oh, God, aren't there any seeds of hope? And then my dreams started to come. I had dreams before that about the book. Yeah. But in two very important dreams, uh, it was very clear to me that um, I was leaving out uh, from the book some very important themes that had to do with listening more closely to the monster. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, in, in the footnotes, I tell one or two of those really important dreams. To, to underline what you were asking me, uh, there's a footnote in the book where I said, I was guided by the dreams as much as I was guided by my thinking in writing this book. And in fact, if I had to balance them, I would say my dreams always connected the excesses of my thinking about the book. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Yeah. How can uh, people uh, listen to their own monster? Well, that's a key question in, in the book. Um, and that's the practical aspect. That's, that's the last two questions. Look into the seeds of hope in the book. And I think some of the ways in which we perhaps can be encouraged to go to the margins and listen to the monsters, because who is the monster? Victor Frankenstein's creature is an emblem of everything that lives in the shadows today. That's why her book is so important after 200 years, why it has been a visionary text that still grabs us and why it invites us to think alongside everything that exists on the margins. Mm -hmm. To me, what that, what that requires is that some of the things that we begin to practice then as ways of coming to terms with our own monstrous capacities is to listen to our dreams, that's one. Two, to cultivate a community of people uh, that are linked together in bonds of creative listening to each other so that we can share with each other not only our accomplishments and achievements, but also our wounds and our losses and our sorrows. Uh, cultivate the capacity for um, an aesthetic relationship to the world, to be able to wander in wonder, and to be able to really recover the sensual, sensuous bond between ourselves and our embodiment. Um, begin then to also value the nature of friendship and um, I think maybe also is to learn how, again, to celebrate the rituals of community that we used to have. I'm not knocking. I mean, you, you have to see the values of technology, but if we forget its shadows, then we fall into some of the problems we face today. So what about the sense of coming together for communion? Yeah. In the original sense of that term and being able to celebrate and be festive, uh, to become uh, guardians of homecoming. In our little everyday acts to celebrate the epiphanies of beauty in the world. Mm. Well, it doesn't take, and you know, it's almost, I don't mean to be 
touching on kind of religious dogma here, but there's something in that line in the Bible to become again like little children. I love walking around with my grandson. One block can take an hour because he sees things I've forgotten how to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and he reminds me of when I was six years old. I used to get up in the morning to see the ants crawl into that brown dirt hole. Yeah, yeah. I forgot that. And I, I've been poorer for that. So guardians of homecoming and memory keepers of what is being lost. Stand up for the simple things. Stand up for the epiphanies of beauty. Stand up for friendship. And you know, most important, maybe, become a uh, kind of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? But you have little everyday acts of resistance to the dominant paradigm. You know, do these simple kinds of things hmm. that maybe refuse to go along with the dominant culture. You know, there's, there's something about uh, the important work of remembering what we are losing. Stand up for that, be a witness. Yeah. Now I do little acts of rebellion. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Little acts of rebellion. Little acts of rebellion. People yeah. are encouraged. Enlist in the army of the soul. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And never, never accept becoming a general because then you get off. Of, in the army of the soul, be one of the foot soldiers. Do a little bit of those acts of rebellion every day in your life. You ever be talk a soldier about for the soul. What? Be a soldier for the soul. Soldier for soul, yeah. A soldier for soul, that's right. Yeah. I mean, it might sound naive and foolish, but you know who's my guiding figure? Is Don Quixote. He dared to dream the impossible dream. He knew they weren't. Mm -hmm. But let's start dreaming the impossible dream and these little acts of rebellion. And why did he do that? Because he was a champion to remember the world we were forgetting with the rise of modern science and technology. So why don't we all become a little quixotic? No. <laughs> we got uh, Donald who has his uh, electronic hand up and so I'll bring him in so he can ask you uh, directly a uh, question and engage in the conversation. Uh, okay. You're uh, unmuted Donald and um, no, not yet. I tried to unmute you but it won't work. Somehow, do you have an ability to unmute yourself, Donald. Otherwise, it's going to be a, a difficult problem to ask a question. Yeah. Then you then you will remain in the margins of, uh, of technology. All right. Um, I'm going to move you back, uh, Donald. Maybe you can type in your question or. Uh... Yeah. I think he's typing. No, yeah, yeah, I think you've invited him to type his question. Yeah. Okay, so there's another, there's a, a, a bunch of other questions. We have also only a minute or two. So I see here one is uh, you did uh, uh, in the past a 10 class audio course uh, and webinar with a Jung platform on uh, the Frankenstein prophecies. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, we have it available online, people can still uh, purchase it. So uh, if they want to do that, just go to youngplatform.com. Um, what else do we have as a question? Well, we're heading towards the end and we will just say, so uh, we will put in an, uh, in an email that we sent this uh, lecture out also a link where they can purchase your book. We encourage people to uh, pre-purchase the book because that uh, will give the uh, publisher uh, the sense that this is uh, a popular book and then it will print more and put more promotion in it. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of uh, being a successful book. And uh, we would love for it to be that way because it's very valuable. It's uh, really, uh, I, I th it's only 130 pages. And 130, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And uh, that, uh, uh, personally, I find it always so uh, pleasant because that uh, then I don't feel uh, overwhelmed just picking up the book. So it's a uh, it's an rich book. It's poetic. It's uh, accessible. It is for uh, for everyone. But there's deep layers in it, so you can chew on it and revisit it. Um, so we all from the Young Platform uh, highly encourage people to uh, to get a copy. 
And um, we want to thank you, Robert, for uh, your time, your insight, your personality, your <laughs> energy, and uh, all the years that you've spent into uh, hanging out with Monster. Hmm. And that uh, uh, has been... Is, uh, has been a, a big journey, and I've always find the beauty of, of of a book that it captures years and years and years of thinking of uh, people, that uh, smart people that have thought about certain topics in a deep way. And then we have just access to that, mm -hmm. so it's beautiful that uh, we can uh, can tap into your uh, your soul and your spirit, and uh, and, and and read about that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, uh, Machiel, I want to thank you. I want to thank the audience. Machiel has been, I don't mean to embarrass you now in front of all these people, but Machiel has been a very important person for me, along with Bonnie Bright, because they dragged me kicking and screaming into the use of technology, not that I was ever opposed to it. And I've learned much and I've been given... Uh, gracious support from from you and i really want to thank you for that we had some wonderful times in salt lake with one of these presentations and uh i see some some questions up there so um i don't know how i can respond to them but in any case i want to thank you and i want to thank everybody who has joined today uh with this yeah We'll uh, copy the questions, give them uh, to you. If there's anyone, you can uh, uh, give the answer to us. We put it out in the uh, email newsletter. And uh, we hope to see you back, uh, Robert. Maybe uh, a talk on dreams or something in the future. Uh, but just get your uh, book uh, into the world and then uh, we'll uh, off the news further. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Participants. Thank you all. Thank you, Machiel. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.